On this episode of Big Boys Don't Cry, we discuss the film Spider-Man 2. You don't have to have seen the film to enjoy the podcast, but if you do listen without having seen it, just be aware there may be spoilers. Enjoy. And they say that a doctor will kill us with his extra four evil arms. <laughs> he is going to defeat the spider, and then he will do us some harm. You, you clearly spent quite a lot of time on that, didn't you? <laughs> oh, 100%. He is killing us, killing us, killing us with his four extra arms. Is it four? I thought it was more than four. Although, to be honest, I couldn't tell. Any time he was on screen, I'm like, oh, there's an arm, there's an arm. He's, he's got lots of like weird mechanical arms that are supposedly driven by artificial intelligence. He's got his two regular arms, two regular legs, and then four robot arms. Hence why he's now an octopus. Two regular legs. The regular legs. Yeah. Um, hence why he's now an octopus, because he's got eight limbs. There's oct- octo-limbs all over the place, though, in this film, aren't there? It's an octo-limb fest. <laughs> it's an octo-limb fest? What do you mean? It's, well, it's like Oktoberfest, but with octopuses' <laughs> limbs, like tentacles. Just with all of, all of the robot tentacles everywhere. Yeah. Maybe it was just the way it was shot, but they made it look like he had thousands of them. Yes. Did he only yeah, have two? I think it's deliberate. Because, uh, yeah, four, four, not quite as scary as a million. But if you no. film it so that it's an indeterminate number of robot arms, then you never know. Well, I'm very disappointed that you chose to use the song from last week's film, which was not in this film, and not to do one of the, the equivalent of this, which is the song Vindicated by Dashboard Confessional, who I'm going to guess is a band that you hate. I don't hate them, but they bore me. So I don't know if that's worse, <laughs> in a way. <laughs> <laughs> this is the emo phase of uh, of the era of music. So we had the post grungy new grunge wave stuff of the last movie, and now there's lots of emo. You got stuff like Dashboard. You got Taking Back Sunday. Yeah. Uh, notice a little bit of Huberstank in there, who kind of Huberstank. straddled the line between one of the worst different... band names ever. <laughs> Extremely bad band name. That's it's similar um, to Catfish and the Bottle Men in that. It comes from a story that is very, very personal to the singer, but that is meaningless to anyone else. Yes. Which apparently is a name that like his baby brother used to call him when they were tiny kids or something. That's right, yeah. It's something like that, isn't it? Yeah. So don't name your band after something like that, because <laughs> it's silly. <laughs> Although I'd rather be in a band called Huberstank than Catfish and the Bottle Men. Yeah. Because Huberstank has a kind of goofy ring to it, whereas Catfish and the Bottle Men just sounds incredibly pretentious. Yeah. Apparently, the story behind that is that when the front man was a kid, there was a, a busker who used to play bottles that he used to see who was called Catfish the Bottle Man. So he essentially stole that guy's name. He just stole a busker's name. Yeah. And that guy's probably dead now. Because <laughs> they killed him. Because of they, Catfish they, and the Bottle Man. Yeah. They, 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 they tracked him down and murdered him so the secret couldn't get out. And then they accidentally revealed it in, a, in, a, in an interview. That guy's dead now and it's their fault. But no, Huberstank isn't, isn't yeah, it's, it's got a goof factor, at least. And also led to a band at my school who played once at a talent show being called Huberspank, which was very funny. <laughs> and they thought it was very, very lewd, lewd and hilarious that they put that up on like a massive banner during the talent show. The, in the like, most oh fresh- no, it was, it was a screen. So I'm pretty sure it was like a projector screen behind them. And they'd done it in like word art. And it was like some massive, really ugly word art that said Huberspank. That's beautiful. And they covered um, In Bloom by Nirvana, and I can't remember what else they did. The The frustrating thing about Catfish and the Bottlemen, apart from their music, is that uh, the, the guy's name is um, Van McCann, <laughs> so they could have been called McCann and the Vans. That's quite good. But unfortunately, his first name isn't actually Van. Is it not? Um, no, so his dad likes Van Morrison, so he nicknames himself Van. But it's not actually Van. No, his first name is really Ryan. Uh, but why would you name yourself after Van Morrison? He's like the most cantankerous old idiot. 
<laughs> it was very, very odd. Very odd. Um, <laughs> who's the other? Who's the other anti-COVID guy who's, who's Eric well Clapton. past his best? Who never really had his best? Eric Clapton. Eric Clapton. Who right. annoyingly that is my son's name. Not Eric Clapton. But Eric is my son's <laughs> Eric name. Clapton is your thought. A one word. It's your son's Eric name. Clapton Johnston. <laughs> no, he's the only bad Eric. All the others are good. And if you ever have to name a child, you all come up against this problem as well. You have to think of a name where all of the people who are called that are good. Like Robert. That's why... that <laughs> Exactly. There's never been a bad Robert. Um, uh, I'm, I'm just going to search people named Eric to see who else comes oh, no. up. You'll get Prince Eric from The Little Mermaid. <laughs> You've got Stressed Eric. Do you remember Stressed Eric? Oh, yeah, yeah. That's, That's a cool a little cartoon. cartoon. Flat Eric, who was the, the goofy jeans mascot. you got Eric Andre, um, who mm-hmm. is obviously funny. Um, Eric Banner. Yeah. Who is obviously hulky. Nothing wrong with that. Um, a professional basketball player called Eric Gordon. Ah. That's what it would be if it was your son. <laughs> exactly, exactly. Eric Stahl, the hockey player. Um, Eric Prids, of course, or oh, Prides. Yeah. I don't know how to pronounce his name, the DJ. I thought it was Prids, but Prids. I don't know for sure. I think that makes sense because he's Swedish, isn't it? So yeah. Prids would make sense. He remixed the song Valerie by Steve Winwood to a video with some gyrating butts in it, and that was very, very popular for, <laughs> for quite a while. And is a he was a he was around he was around for a fair while was old old Pridzy yeah doing his little doing his little DJs I think he's still going I believe so yeah there's a, a baseball player I really like called Eric Thames who I think is the most muscular baseball player of all time he's he's absolutely jacked and he's Excuse very me, good at playing Paddy, baseball in this country we pronounce it Thames I know <laughs> Eric Thames <laughs> <laughs> I prefer that pronunciation Thames the River That's Thames. Way that's way better. I live in the Thames Valley, did you know? The Thames Valley, yeah, yeah. that's great. That makes it sound, like, <laughs> mysterious and glamorous. Oh, the the Thames, Valley of the Thames. Thames Valley, instead of Thames. That's like something that would be in Game of Thrones. Who does who does he play for, then, Eric Thames? Well, now I think he's in Korea. Um, ah, but he's played okay. for... Mo- he's, he was drafted by the Blue Jays. He played for the Washington Nationals. He's played for a lot of teams, actually, and he's good. Oh, very nice. He's played in very Japan nice. as well. And he was also on the he was on the Korean no, he's in Japan right now. He was in Korea before and he appeared on the Korean version of the Masked Singer, which is the original Masked Singer. That's where it originates. Yes, yeah, that's right. That's right. I mean, you've got to be you've got to be a good um baseballer, which I believe is the correct noun for them, the baseballers. Yep. Um to, to wish I was in... a little bit taller, wish I was a baseballer. Wish I was a baseballer. Um baseball off baseball off <laughs> as Taylor Swift once sang um uh they've got good good baseballing over in Korea and in Japan so, yeah yeah you know to make the transition over there from from playing the game in America surely you've got to be you've got to be skilled as well you know it's it's, it's not like an elephant graveyard for careers like going over to play in the American football uh by that I mean soccer the, <laughs> the MLS major League soccer um, where lots of people go to end their careers. It's got to be, you know, you've still got to have your skills to be able to play over in, in Japan or Korea, I imagine. Oh, yeah, absolutely. It's where a lot of lot of players go when they're perhaps in the either middling or they haven't necessarily got that major league spot, but they're sort of like maybe being sent up and down between the majors and the minors or they're sort of close to cracking it or they're perhaps towards the end of their careers. Like Eric Thames is in his late 30s. So, like, he's been on kind of minor league deals. So if you're on a minor league deal, it's like you have to earn your spot on the major league team whilst playing in the minors. And a lot of players go to Japan or Korea instead of doing that because they're guaranteed better money and more playing time and that kind of thing. So, yeah, it's still the standard's still very high. Ah, oh, there we go. There we go. There you go. Baseball spe- facts. <laughs> Baseball facts. And speaking of high standards... Um, the last Spider-Man movie before this one set high standards for us because it was... So it set the fun. bar very high and then the Spider-Man came along and jumped right over it. And was uh, was continuing to spider some men. So did you enjoy Did you enjoy Spider-Man 2? I did. I really enjoyed it. And it, it was a pleasure because with the first one, there were still things that I hadn't remembered because I hadn't seen it in a long time, but I have less strong memories of Spider-Man 2 and Spider-Man 3. So... 
yeah, it, w- it was almost like it was. A, I could vaguely remember the plot and the, the villain and stuff, but it was almost like seeing it with fresh eyes, and it held up really, really well. I really enjoyed it, and it was a, a really, really good sequel. Wasn't yes, it? yeah, um, I completely agree. It's, this feels it's a masterpiece, actually, a masterclass in what a sequel should be. I mean, it's it's specific to the superhero genre, so you can't just take any film and make a sequel like this. But in terms of films where it's set up that way then this is how to execute it. Yeah, 100%. This movie, it understands what the original film is all about. It provides lots of nuance for people who watch the original film, but it also works really well as a standalone movie as well. I think you don't necessarily have to have seen the first movie to get the point of this film. Yeah, I think if you went into this cold, you would still really, really enjoy it. Which, considering all of the through threads from the previous movie, is actually quite an amazing thing. Um... You know, because you've got all of the stuff about uh, Norman Osborn and the re- the relationship stuff and everything like that, but actually, it still manages to be a a, a good standalone movie, um, which is the kind of thing you exactly want from a from a from a sequel is to have all of those connections to the original, but to be able to stand on its own two feet at the same time and have those the intensification of the initial themes and moving towards them in different ways i mean all of all of the spider-man movies and every spider-man thing is about with great power comes great responsibility that's that's the the overarching theme of all of spider-man stuff and this movie really gets into the nitty-gritty of that in an interesting way that is the line that they say the line that he says to the camera at the end of every spider-man film Spider-Man looks at the camera, doesn't take off his mask, and says, with great power comes great responsibility. With great spider (laughs) comes great men. (laughs) With great spiders come great men. Um, But yes, and I think it's... um, it's, When you take that step back and and think about what what Marvel is today, which, as we talked about on last week's episode as well, it's like it just seems so completely impenetrable to anyone outside it. You know, e- even me as someone who knows a little bit about it, but not much, I feel like I couldn't go and watch like that Legends thing or whatever, because I know nothing about whatever is supposed to go into that and who all those characters are and all that kind of thing. Whereas this, the fact that they managed to make a film that once again, like the first one, is just completely accessible and that you could go into cold is so far away from what we have today. And I, f- I found that amazing, actually. Yeah, it is really a movie. The Amazing Spider-Man. <laughs> It is really a movie that feels from a previous era of films, and I notice it's in a few ways. One of which is that this is a comic book movie that doesn't have like an hour long, like action finale, where it's like not yeah. one giant hour long fight scene. Which no, it's essentially he runs to find Bad Octo Man in his weird lab. He ch- they have a bit of a fight. He talks him down, and then Octo Man jumps in the river. Yeah. Yeah. And that's about it. But it works from a thematic perspective. It works from a character perspective. So it has such a strong emotional punch that it doesn't need all of the big CGI punches to to bring it to being a satisfying conclusion. I mean, like, I, I'm not going to shit on Marvel here specifically about doing this because really the turning point for superhero movies with ending so long that you get bored was probably Man of Steel which has this massive punch up where you can't see what's going on because it's two supermen smashing each other into skyscrapers for an hour and it just gets How really boring. How are there two supermen? So you've Supers got men. you've got Zod, you know Zod. Who's Zod? So Superman, you know, the last surviving Kryptonian. Supersman. Supersman. He ain't the last surviving Kryptonian. There's other Kryptonians every now and again. And what? One of them is Zod, who's a big old bad guy. This isn't anything new, Paddy. This is something that's been part of Superman for for probably about 50 years now, okay. if not longer. This isn't a new thing they made up. Um, and so, yeah, he fights Zod and, and smashes him into stuff, um, which is it's, it's frustrating because have you, have you seen Man of Steel? No. It's an interesting... I think I've, read, I've only seen the old, the old, super, the old Superman, Superman, which is still with, the best Terry Superman Hatcher. movie yeah. no, with Terry Hatcher, the, the TV show. Yeah, I've only seen those. You haven't, I don't know if I've seen the movies. You haven't seen the... Um, but I did used to enjoy the TV shows. You haven't seen the Christopher Lee ones from the 70s? Um, I don't know if I have, you know. I suppose if you, if you, if you haven't... Like, yeah. aesthetically, in my head, I know what it looks like and what it feels like, but I cannot confirm or deny that I've actually seen a full movie. Yeah, the, those Christopher Reeves ones from back then are, um, are really interesting, yeah, actually. Yeah, not Christopher Lee... <laughs> 
Is that what I said? You said Christopher Lee. <laughs> and I was I, thinking it over in my head. I know that's wrong, but I can't remember. It was Christopher Reeve. I meant, guy. Yeah. meant to say Christopher Reeve. I um, if it was Christopher Lee, I would have seen all of them. Yeah, I'd, I'd watch Christopher Lee as Superman. God um, rest his soul. <laughs> No, so 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 Christopher, yeah, Christopher Reeve as Superman. Um, there was one in seventy eight, and then I think was it the next one in the eighties, or was it the next year? And they were really, they were like real prototype comic book movies. Um, yeah, and they're really good. They're really interesting films. And, and I feel like really without well those, we don't have Sam Raimi Spider Man. No, no, and I think I think those those early superman films the first two are really good after that they they drop off quite badly um but they're they're really interesting and they they really get to the heart of him as a character um and man of steel is an interesting film some of it works incredibly well other bits of it don't it feels a little bit heartless which is odd for a superman movie because superman's all about you know that the whole thing about superman is that he's an alien who's more human than human beings that's that's the main point of superman um and it kind of doesn't do that <laughs> so there's all of these bits in it that are really interesting uh you got great performances from russell crowe as superman's dad um and kevin costner as superman's adopted dad who tells him don't use your powers that's a bad thing to use your powers <laughs> which is not very not very in line with superman um he should have stuck to baseball films. <laughs> <laughs> it's funny it's it's got a big sort of field of dreams energy actually the bits with um the bits with kevin costner in of course it does um, because that's what he's like in everything and i love him for it <laughs> um but then yeah the whole movie ends with this big old punch up and it gets very boring and that was kind of the turning point where like every comic book movie after that point needed to do something similar wait which is the one with time. kevin spacey uh, that is Superman Returns. I've seen that one. I remember uh, <laughs> seeing that one because I ha- I remember thinking his acting was terrible, and even at the time, and I remember him being Lex Luthor and saying on point Kryptonite, like in a really <laughs> ridiculous <laughs> camp way. That really made me laugh. Uh, so I, I'm, I know I've seen that one. That might be the only one I've seen. Uh, well, there we go. Well, you should watch the seventies ones. Well, the first two. The first two are good. Um, they sound fun. Yeah, and and they've kind of got a similar thing to um, to the the Sam Raimi Spider Man's, where they clearly really really love the character, and they're just enjoying it. Um, amazing John Williams musical score as well, and obviously the music here is again really really good. Um, yeah, but um, what, Danny Elfman is a genius. Yeah, no, he he definitely is. Have you heard his actual music recently? He's done. He's put out a weird album that's good recently, yeah, hasn't he? He's put out. He's put out some great music the last couple of years, um, which obviously you know he got started doing Oingo Boingo, the, the <laughs> amazingly named band that he was in before he went into doing doing film. That is a good band um, name. That you know that is a really good band name. Look upon those that work, ye mighty in despair, Catfish <laughs> and the Bottle Men. <laughs> exactly. Uber stank. <laughs> Uber stank. Um, but yeah, no, he's been doing some cool music recently. It's been very good. Um, it's uh, it's it's yeah, it's well worth a listen. Um, it's uh, yeah, he's it's he's he's a strange he's a strange man, and he makes strange he's music. Got a much more great. varied CV than you think. Yeah, and yeah, he's a multi instrumentalist, a composer of so much great stuff, and yeah, just a really a guy who also seems like he does whatever the hell he wants as well so i I always respect that in an artist yeah i um big mess it's called sorry i was trying to look for the for the album name big mess that was released last year is really cool well worth a listen go and go and give it a go and give it a listen and then he did a song this so trent reznor appeared on um on big mess and then i think they also released another song this year together um oh, that's which cool. is like i mean what a combination <laughs> danny elfman and trent Reznor. Um, fantastic it's um, love to see it yeah it's uh it, it's really cool um so yeah the music really augments this film brilliantly as as it did in the first film but going back to what you were saying before is you, you can tell that this film loves the character um that a lot of it you still get what the first film has where the scenes of him swinging across the rooftops and just doing spidey stuff are fun but it doesn't overdo that and i think a lot of films if you have that 
and it just focuses on that and doesn't actually have a plot or a good story or a good romance or all of those kinds of things you're like well okay that's cool but give me a story to like give me something to root for like this still balances those things really well just as well as it did in the first one yeah it does it really gets to the heart of spider-man being a poor human man um you know the the movie opens with him delivering pizza as spider-man it's great yeah what, what... for 41 blocks no one would order a pizza I, i've been to new york you wouldn't order pizza from 41 blocks away that's quite far away maybe real new york people will, co- will correct me but that feels like a long way to order pizza see the thing anyway. is that it's clearly being done for a business meeting and they're expecting them not to be able to deliver the pizza so there's that free. time so that it's free yeah it's capitalism baby capitalist pizza a giant corporation undoing the the small pizza maker that's what it is yep. <laughs> so he uses his spidey powers to deliver the pizza and it's still late yeah but yeah you've, you've got all of this struggle of him as a human being you know um unable to maintain like friendships and relationships with people unable to pay his bills unable to keep a job failing at college all of that stuff where it's like you can see the weight that being spider-man's putting on him because obviously being a superhero isn't all bells and whistles all the time it's not all celebrations there's clearly you know there is that barrier between the human being and the the person in the mask no being spider-man doesn't pay the bills unless you steal money and that's not allowed is it no exactly i mean i mean that's something that's one of the great things about Spider-Man as a character is it often gets into that element of him where it's okay he's not you know he's not rich he's not Batman he's not an alien and 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 a lot of you know, you know like super Batman is a Tory isn't he oh 100% <laughs> in his massive mansion <laughs> you find out that that Bruce Wayne's been doing heavy donations to Mitch McConnell yeah it's like oh i just agree with their fiscal policies it's like Sure, Batman. Sure, Batman. Batman's worried that everything's too woke these days. <laughs> Definitely. I can't even go and beat up poor people anymore without someone criticising me. It's ba- Batman is PC, about to queue for PC 30 hours mad. to see the Queen's coffee. <laughs> PC gone mad. <laughs> um, any, anyway. Um, yeah, Spider-Man's, Spider-Man's not that. He's not... And a lot of superheroes, they don't go into the detail of you know, how they live their day-to-day lives because um, because they they assume that people don't want to see that. But actually with Spider-Man, you get a lot of that day-to-day life stuff. Um, and I think it's really... And that's, that's really important. And I think it's part of the reason why Spider-Man is so endearing to so many people. He's a man of the people. Yeah, exactly. He's, he's, a, he's a real human. Um, and this movie, yeah, it really gets to the... really gets to the core of that. A lot of it is about humanity and like time and time again in this movie it's not about beating the bad guys or stopping criminals it's about protecting people and saving people and getting people out of difficult situations so you know um you've got people driving erratically and spider-man stops the car you've got people uh in a building on fire and he, he 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 tries to save them. You've got the train at the end, which is still one of the best comic book movie scenes ever made, I'd say. Yeah, where once that started, I was like, them. I remember this. This is the train one. Yeah, yeah. And everyone remembers the train scene um, because, again, it's about him putting his life on the line to protect normal human beings, not to fight Dr. Octopus. Dr. Octopus is fucked off at this point. Spider-Man could have chased him if he wanted to, but that's not what he's about. He's about saving people, protecting people. Yeah, and Dr. Octopus, the whole thing with that is almost secondary to his sort of journey of am I or am I not Spider-Man? How do I pull through this, isn't it? It's such a character-driven piece that, that the villain almost doesn't matter, even though he's great. Yeah, yeah, I think you're completely right. And in fact, the the villain serves as the the foil to Spider-Man in a villain sense, but also in that personality sense where they're both facing the same problems, essentially, where due to uh, science gone wrong, they've been given the special abilities and both of them want to better the world in a way where um, Dr. Octopus wants to build this 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 fusion reactor. In case you missed it after he repeated it several times, he wants the power of the sun in the palm of his hand. 
<laughs> exactly, exactly. And like the 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 interest that he has is noble in intention. Essentially, it's to create this. You know, he's doing this to better the world to get rid of you know um, energy energy sources which are going to eventually destroy us. Um, and, but obviously, the the power of who he is, both in terms of his his ambition and intellect, and then his giant robot arms. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> um, uh, get gets to him, so he does things like break the law. He tries to kill people. He definitely does kill people. He robs a bank. Um, he kidnaps people. He nearly destroys a train full of people. And he throws a car into a window at precisely the right time for the plot. <laughs> yeah, I like to think that he was waiting until it, he was just keeping an eye on Mary Jane and thinking, right, come on then. What's the right moment for me to do this? Right, Standing she's, there outside she's, the window. She's leaning in now, right now. Lob the <laughs> lob the car. <laughs> He's just holding um, the car in his arm, his like bionic arms outside the window. Loads of people walking past, going, "What is that guy doing? <laughs> What's he up to?" Um, but but all of all of that, the the whole purpose of it isn't, um, you know, it's not. I'm going to get really rich. It's it's to build this big old reactor because he thinks this is what the world needs and this is what I deserve for my genius. And so you can see that as the opposite of Spider-Man, where Spider-Man also has all of these powers, but instead it's about, um, you know, Spider-Man would never rob a bank. Spider-Man would would never put people in harm's way deliberately to further his goals to make the, make the city safe or to make the world a better place. Um, no. And and you've got the whole thing of him also, you know, shying away from being Spider Man, um, where the pressure of that becomes too much. And I think that's a really interesting um, route for this movie to go down for quite a lot of the runtime as well. A lot of this movie is spent on Peter Parker trying not to be Spider Man. Yeah, much more than you remember. And actually, it's only really the last third where he actually does the proper Spidey stuff. Yeah, yeah. A lot of this movie is him walking around. <laughs> <laughs> just being just, a regular just guy being a regular guy it's 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 not spider-man it's it's man man um but before we move on i just want to say alfred molina is truly brilliant as dr octopus isn't he? absolute he's legend fantastic. he's 69 um, years old <laughs> nice um and he's he's great i mean i think this is up there with willem dafoe as um as the green goblin slash norman osborn i think it's the Absolutely. same the same quality of performance here is truly great um you think of alfred molina as being like a really serious actor don't you but then he last appeared on this show when we were talking about prince of persia the sounds of time so you know <laughs> that's true he's done some really varied stuff over the years you know some some truly brilliant stuff and obviously lots of lots of west end acting as well um yeah. but then also um what's that what's that really nonsense horror movie he's in um oh what's it called i'm gonna have to look this up you know he seems like he's really willing to have a laugh and to do goofy roles you know with passion and that kind of thing and i really really appreciate that in an actor yes yeah that's it he's in species have you ever seen species no i feel like you've talked about this before there's a sexy alien woman who is seducing men to give birth to to more aliens Oh, that's um, right, and uh, and lots of people are trying to stop stop her. Oh, also stars Ben Kingsley. Ben yeah, Kingsley, I think, yeah, Michael might. Madsen, Forrest Whitaker. Uh, <laughs> I he's mentioned got an, this on the Prince of Persia episode. He's <laughs> got an amazing cast, but is truly, truly a piece of trash, but in the best possible way. Um, but yeah, so he does all of that, all of that kind of stuff alongside, you know, more, more really, you know, some really clever movies, some really sensible old-fashioned acting movies and i like that about him i like that he does this variety yeah absolutely and in this he's just brilliant you believe him as as a scientist a science man don't you even though the science is completely bogus yes yeah the science is is nonsense you're like you're just you're saying science words and i'm, I'm not really listening but it all sounds cool <laughs> It all sounds like it could feasibly be real, so let's just roll with it. I mean, this is a series where a man gets bitten by a radioactive spider and then doesn't just immediately die um, <laughs> and instead gets superpowers. Um, I also wanted to call out that his arms look amazing still. I mean, this this movie is old now in the grand scheme of things. Yeah. Compared to the, the PS2 skeletons from Spider-Man, things moved on quite a lot. <laughs> in the two years they really they did because this, this was 2004 wasn't it but but the cgi on on those 
on those arms for him the robot arms looks amazing when the big energy ball is sinking into the river at the end that looked a bit shonky but other than that the cgi was really good yeah i was really surprised at how well it held up it's it's really impressive um well well worth watching um just to see how actually you know this is nearly 20 years ago now two years away from being 20 years old if you were born in the year that this film came out you're probably old enough to drink now yeah yeah in this um, country if you were born the day that this movie came out then you would be able to get wrecked down the pub yep um, which is which is amazing when you think about it, how good it looks and how fresh it feels still. This feels, you know, this movie hasn't aged. It feels it feels amazing still. Yeah. The arms also look a bit like those, like, scary things that come out of the bed in The Haunting from 1999. Yes. Yeah, that's true. Um, speaking of scary, um, it was nice to see Sam Raimi getting a little bit of cheeky scares in here and there. You got some jump scares with the with the tentacle arms, the robot arms. Yeah, yeah, they were genuinely um, scary. You've got the, the there's that amazing scene where they're going to try and cut off the arms after the initial accident when he becomes Doctor Octopus, and the arms come alive and kill all of the doctors in the room, and that genuinely feels like something from a horror movie. Yeah, that kind of freaked me out a bit. That scene. Yeah, the use of the use of shadows, the 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 way that people get dragged off by them, the really nasty quick editing in certain places. It's really well done. And obviously, you know, Sam Raimi is an amazing horror director. So obviously he was gonna be able to do this as well. But it, it is really refreshing to watch a a big blockbuster movie that still treats the audience with respect to have those scary scenes in where you know it's one of those things i still love about jurassic park where jurassic park Mm. has those scenes that really feel scary yeah and you can have those elements in a big you know blockbuster movie whereas these days a lot of the time they shy away from having that variety and having that tension what's amazing about jurassic park is that a guy gets eaten while he's on the toilet and it's not funny It's, it's kind of funny (laughs) <laughs> but, a little bit, yeah. <laughs> but but no i know what you mean it's genuinely like just a oh my god uh this is it's, it's the vulnerability of him it's pouring with rain and he's looking up at this giant t-rex and yeah chairs. and screaming yeah <laughs> <laughs> and that was the thing in the scene when dr octopus is killing all the doctors they're all screaming as well whenever he's around everyone's screaming all the time they are all screaming all the time in a way it's... that i feel like they weren't doing for the green goblin because he was a bit too goofy wasn't he he just sort of yeah. appears on his glider and he's like, out, am I? <laughs> yeah, everyone was kind of <laughs> raising an eyebrow, weren't they? Um, I was like, what's th- what's going on here? Oh, God, I'm a skeleton. Yeah. <laughs> um, whereas here, yeah, everyone's everyone's screaming all the time. Um, it's, it's yeah, and lots of really good, like, close-up zooms into screams and things like that. You really get the terror of... Of, uh, of 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 how nasty he is, how terrifying he is. The terror of bogus science. <laughs> yeah. Oh my god, this isn't scientifically accurate. Are we going to become one of those film critics, Paddy? No, absolutely not. Like, oh, Never. that's not how it would really happen. Never, because it doesn't matter. <laughs> it's fun. There's a there's a guy like trying to turn the machine off, and it's not working. And you're looking at it, going like. Something with that much power and radiation or whatever wouldn't be in like an apartment building in this in a city in a densely populated area. That would be underground in a Hawkins lab type situation, surely. But whatever, Spider Man two, you roll with it. I think you'll find that actually that kind of train has an automatic stop system if it gets damaged. Oh simply yes, simply cut right. off the power to the route. Um, naught out of ten really bad movie and there's no way it would actually be ending like in a thing that would just throw it into the river there isn't any anywhere on the new york subway system that actually ends and buffers like that Uh, i think you'll find that if someone saw spider-man without his mask on they would obviously talk to the press about who he is i mean who are these people honestly completely broke my immersion in the film <laughs> Mort out of 10 they would turn him into J. Jonah Jameson they'd give him to the cops it's 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 you know thematically appropriate for the movie that Spider-Man is New York and New York is Spider-Man yeah it's taking that scene from the first one where the, where everyone threw rubbish at the Green Goblin and it's like 
one upping that, isn't it? Yeah, I, I, exactly. Yeah, I like that. Exactly. It, it, it's, it's cheesy. Doing... It's very, very cheesy. It's very look. Like, yes, here comes New York. New York is a character, but it's like, yeah, this is this is fun. Yeah, it is. It is cheesy, but it's meant to be cheesy. You know, it's um, this is this is what this movie is all about. Is this a movie full of heart? And you know what? You can make movies with heart. Nothing. It doesn't all have to be cynical. Yeah, exactly. And it feels a lot less cynical than the superhero movies of today, doesn't it? Yeah, yeah, exactly, exactly. It's 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 earnest, which I like. It's very earnest, and a lot of the acting is very earnest as well. Yeah, there's no there's no Joss Whedon eye roll going. Well, that just happened. Or I can't believe I've got another supervillain again. Honestly, what am I like? <laughs> um, which I think I think the Whedonization of movies is one of the worst things to possibly. Buffy the happen. Vampire Slayer was good. Everything else he's done, whatever. Like, I don't like. Care. Don't get me wrong. I really love Buffy the Vampire Slayer. Um, but the way that that cynicism worked so well in Buffy, because that's the whole point of it, is these jaded Gen X teenagers or or early millennial, what are they called XN- Xennials, aren't they? The the crossover period. Um, th- that that kind of cynicism. No, put it into was a because it had series. Anthony Head in it. <laughs> that that kind of cynicism put into a horror series worked really well for that thing. But then developing that kind of like attitude into other things just kind of it takes away from the the importance and the power of it. Yeah, you, know? you don't have to be knowing about everything. You know, no, no, you can, you can. You can be earnest about things. You know, you can yeah. have jokes and goofs and goofs. And I feel like Spider Man Two had more goofs, especially at the start. It's trying to make a whole bunch of jokes about him being not being Spider Man and not being able to pay his bills or whatever. And it's like, yeah, this is it has has a bit of goof factor and a bit of fun, and it's laughing at itself as well. Yeah, and there's that great scene where he's at the uh, he's at the uh, the the ceremony or whatever it is. There is a photographer. Um, and he keeps trying to get drinks or appetizers off off trays, and someone always beats him to it. And then when he finally gets one, it's an empty drink. Like that's genuine good comedy there out of those scenes. Um, there's a lot of humor in this movie to be found, um, and it's quite it's quite open about it. You know, this is a funny movie, um, but yeah, it, it does it in a way that works with the character and works with what they're trying to do. Yeah, absolutely. And, you know, the the characters are good as well, you know, as well as it being a real character driven piece of Spider-Man himself. Again, all the other characters shine in their own way, don't they? Although I have to say I was a bit annoyed by James Franco in this one and by Harry's character wasn't really given as much development as the others. Were. It's like, all you need to know is he he's annoyed his dad's dead. He's now on the board of the company that fired his dad, because that's, of course, how it all works, even though he's 20 years old or whatever. And but there was one scene where like after um there's like after after the um he becomes Doctor Octopus and it's all like the thing has gone wrong. He's standing in the street outside with his handlers or whatever and he, he's like very, very seriously goes, I am ruined in like a really wooden way and that made me laugh <laughs> quite a lot, but that was bad. He he wasn't great in this. He was he was not good in this. Um, I think it's fair. I like to the say. scene at the end the, when the, the Green Goblin mask is like haunting him and trying to get him to become the Green Goblin. I like that, but that's not because yeah, of him. That's because yeah. the, the Green Goblin that's, mask acts better than he Green does Goblin. in that scene. <laughs> yeah, he's he's not good in this movie. He's probably the only person in this film which I don't think works. Um, he worked fine in the first movie as like rich kid at high school, but here where you've got that extra dramatic requirement, the grumpy businessman James Franco doesn't work at and you know that it's only um, there to set up for spider-man 3 which is a little cheap that's probably my yeah, only complaint yeah. about this film yeah uh, people were, were people after spider-man 1 going we want more we want more harry osborne <laughs> <laughs> probably not <laughs> but i think you know they were clearly then building up to have have him in spider-man 3 as 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 the the, the, the harry osborne stands are going to come for us they're going to come for us now. Uh, how dare you talk badly about James Franco as Harry Osborn, the greatest acting role in the history of comic book movies. Yeah. <laughs> um, <laughs> oh dear. 
um so yeah it's but apart from that i think everyone is really good yeah i i think it works i think it works really well um wouldn't you say? absolutely everything about this works there, there's nothing you know J. Jonah Jameson is back, of course, and Mary Jane's going to marry his son, who, as well as being his son, is an astronaut, of course, which is a nice and kind of silly but fun touch. And he's awful in the best possible way. And there's a bit <laughs> when like, they try to do the upside down kiss, and it's actually really nasty. <laughs> <laughs> yep. It is. It is. It's like, oh, dear. Oh, dear. Um, yeah, it, the, the, the romantic side of this movie as well is quite interesting, isn't it? it's it's it kind of chugs along where again it feels like it's maybe building up to the final movie a little bit and you get the payoff at the end yeah that's the thing what i was worried that it was going to be was that i obviously as you're supposed to i hated the ending of the first one that he was like i can't be with you and in this one i thought it was going to basically just sort of chug along with that and not actually do anything with it because it was going to save the reveal for spider-man 3 and then i remembered oh no it actually does it in this film so at the end of this film, she knows he's Spider-Man. She's still cool with it. She jilts the astronaut at the al- at the altar and runs uh, to his house in a very, very tastefully shot bit of her running through New York and the park in her wedding dress, runs to his apartment, and she's like, I want to be with you, Spider-Man. And you're like, yes, this is good. This is what I want. This is This is the ultimate romantic payoff, and I'm here for it. Yeah, yeah, exactly. It works really well. Um, you get... It's basically a rom-com ending. Yeah. In a way. It is. Um, which which works perfectly for this kind of movie again because of that earnestness because of that s- straightforwardness of it that it, it you know it just it just works it's it's nice yeah and I I thought the kind of the flip flopping around telling her or kind of like we can't be together stuff was going to be tedious but it wasn't so I was grateful for that yeah it felt again like a real reaction to it where yeah you. Spider Man, Peter Parker's barely been in her life because of him being Spider Man. So, of course, she's not going to immediately be like, Oh, I'm going to run away with you. It's all fine because you turned up to my play once. Yeah. Um, rather than going, Oh, you know, but then actually, then of course, you can't, you can't fake what your heart wants. And maybe she got rushed along in the moment to be with, with, um, astronaut, um, J. J Jonah Jameson Jr which I think they should, they should call him for the extra J. Yeah. So, so yeah, so it ends up with that thing where she does make that decision to run away. And it's like, oh, okay, yeah, it's, it's Mary Jane and Peter Parker. Meant to be. Yeah, Apart finally. from, Do you know about the comics, how she dies in one of the strands of the comics? No, I don't care. Uh, <laughs> I'm going to tell you then, since you don't care. Um, so, obviously, all of the comics change all the time. Yeah. yeah. Um. One of them is because she has too much radioactive spider jizz. Really? This is a thing. Um, <laughs> All right. Actually I happens suppose in that, the st- that sounds scientifically one of, accurate. <laughs> one of the stories, basically, because he's radioactive, also his jizz is radioactive, and so uh, she he ends up giving her cancer and killing her makes sense um which is nice i mean that's what you <laughs> that's what you want in a spider-man comic isn't it is the the idea that spider-man anyone who spider-man has sex with is gonna die because of his spider jizz um sorry you probably have to put a, a, a content warning at the beginning of this episode <laughs> about spider jizz but yeah that, that's one of the stupidest things that's ever happened in comic books i think yeah that's really dumb and i'm glad that that's not in the films <laughs> Yeah, I, I mean, this happened relatively recently, I think. Although this there's, there's like no a... sexy stuff in the films, is there? They're all PG thirteen. They're all P- they they have some they have some nice snogging. Yeah, that's all you need. You know, you don't need you don't need really obvious sex in a Spider Man movie. It's not what it's about. It's about love. No, it's not about not about the sex. Stop telling us about Spider Man's jizz comic books. <laughs> we don't, we don't want to hear it. <laughs> No, I don't want to hear that. But Mary Jane in this film is great, and she continues the trend of the first one of having some agency and actually being a character and not just being there to to big him up or be his romantic interest and provide that kind of, can I, can I not be Spider-Man? You actually believe she's a real character and stuff. 
yeah, she she is a person with her own ambitions and her own character. And yeah, you get the the screaming of a of a damsel in dis- distress. But while she's being held by Dr. Yeah. Octopus, she's like sassing him and telling him what to do and stuff in a way that does make a little bit of difference to what he's doing, doesn't it? Yes, yeah, it does. It does. It um it it shows her becoming more of a defined character than the first movie as well, I think. Yeah. Um, which is nice. Um, I am going to share with you in chat, um, what is this? just in case you think I'm making it up. No, I don't think uh, you'd make up something like that. <laughs> um, in case you think I'm making it up, you can see the actual comic where, um, and to quote Spider-Man, um, this is a dramatic reading of Spider-Man Reign, which is a comic series. Oh, I see. Yeah. From... 2007 I'm gonna say um, the doctors didn't understand how it happened how you'd been poisoned with radioactivity how your body slowly became riddled with cancer I did I was I am filled with radioactive blood <clears throat> and not just blood every fluid touching me loving me <laughs> who wants that in spider-man I'm sorry disgusting who wants that in Spider-Man? That is like the least Spider-Man y thing ever. Is that for like adult Spider-Man fans who wanted him to become dark and edgy? I think it is, yeah. That's what all comics go through this kind of edgelord phase eventually, and it's bad. Oh, the, looking at this comic series, it features a retired Spider-Man who returns to combat injustices in a future New York City. So it's basically doing Batman Returns. But for Spider Man, and I assume some Batman, some Spiders Men, <laughs> the 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 Animal Men. Yeah, that's what they could do. They could they could hang out together. Um, what's what's it called? The Batman, the Batman one by 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 um Miller. Oh, uh, um, Miller. It's dark, dark and rainy, dark and Edge Lords love it. Is what it's <laughs> the called. Dark Knight Returns? Is that it? Yeah, the which is kind of interesting. Yeah. It looks at at sort of vigilantism and and fascism in a in an interesting way this is before frank miller went completely off the deep end yeah and was still making interesting stuff um but yeah that's not what you want from spider-man what you want from spider-man is a guy in a suit doing one-liners and occasionally doing science and, he's goofy and doing goof goof stuff he's a goofball he's a goofy science kid yeah and he says you stuff like you're out gobby what was his one-liner in this? He had one good one-liner. I forgot to write it down. Uh, I didn't write it down, but I thought there were a few. Yeah, th- there was one in particular that tickled me. Not as many as J. Jonah Jameson, who obviously says stuff like, I need you to cover the planetarium because my society photographer got hit in the head by a polo ball. <laughs> Which is really good. Well, you're spending liked... any more on this thing, you can pick the daisies off my grave. I liked um, how how he did that immediate heel turn where he was going i was wrong about spider-man he was he was protecting us yeah. he was the city's protector he's uh and then <laughs> spider-man steals a suit he's a thief <laughs> it's just brilliant yeah so he he continued doing his very very funny thing yeah uh, when his son gets jilted at the altar he immediately calls the caterers to to not open the caviar he's perfect yeah he's so he's so good really good again um the 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 great bit where he goes i'll give you 150 dollars for them 300 that's outrageous done (laughs) (laughs) and it's fun that's the thing yeah all of this stuff is fun all that kind of dark edgelord stuff is not fun and comic book (laughs) films should be fun well i think you can make dark comic book movies for characters which work with like batman for instance you can make dark but batman Batman isn't fun that's the, that's the thing. <laughs> Batman's never been fun, apart from like the camp uh, ones with yeah, Robin in the sixties, um, and and the um, the 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 ones in the eighties and nineties had some humour in them as well. Um, particularly oh, bat, bat, the bat dance one. That's that's got some some goof factor. Or the Adam mostly Adam thanks West. to Prince. Yeah, yeah, but, yeah, yeah. And th- but then yeah, when you look at the ones with um, the Tim Burton ones, they had some comedy in there. Um, alongside the darkness, um, and then the ones that came off of that Batman Forever and Batman and Robin were very, very goofy. But then, obviously, since then, Batman is the serious one for real men. He's he's like yeah. just for men, but 
comic book heroes, <laughs> isn't he? He's the comic book, the comic book equivalent of a Lynx Africa book set. <laughs> <laughs> That's who Batman is. <laughs> yeah um it smells great so so he can he can he can do the serious stuff but i think there's some comic book characters and i think a lot of comic book characters in fact where you need that humor you need that heart you need that silliness like yeah maybe you're not gonna make a goofy punisher movie but <laughs> someone like someone like spider-man someone like um like captain america you need that kind of goofiness to it because it's an inherently silly thing yeah the thing that disappointed me most about watchmen was that it didn't have a seven minute long tap dance routine (laughs) i mean i wouldn't have put past alan moore to put one in to the actual comic to be honest no because he does whatever he wants he does what he does what he wants and Um, i've been flip-flopping on alan moore over the years but actually recently i've come to really really respect him because he's always saying very very sensible things about capitalism and culture and I very, very much appreciate that, even though I'm like, I thought Watchmen was good, but I couldn't get into a whole bunch of his other work. And yeah. I thought he was really overrated and beloved by edgelord boys. But actually, he is extremely intelligent and I really respect him. I mean, the thing to really like that I really like about Alan Moore is that he despises his edgelord fans. Yeah. <laughs> he obviously really hates <laughs> That's why them, I like him. Because they haven't understood the works that they're reading. Um, I think yeah, he he's got some really interesting stuff in his career. Um, it doesn't always hit the mark. There are sometimes elements that don't work. Um, but overall, I think he makes interesting comics. Yeah. Um, and I think interesting comics are often some of the best comics. Absolutely. Um, so yeah, no, Alan Moore. I'm I I can I can stand for Alan Moore. I think he's good. Watchmen is is brilliant. Um, you know, it, it's it's a brilliant deconstruction of superheroes, and it remains one of the best examples of that sort of niche subgenre to this day. Um, however, many of, is it thirty years since Watchmen came out yet, or twenty five years? Or I think it's more than that potentially. Oh yeah, no, it must be. It was the eighties, wasn't it, that it came? Yeah, out? yeah, it's eighty six or something. So yeah, so Watchmen, so forty years plus, maybe. Yeah. Um, that it's been around, and yeah, it's um, it's still it's still amazing. Um, but it's it's no Spider Man two, <laughs> no obviously obvious. And v, v for Vendetta we talked about before, didn't we? About yeah, we've done V for I mean, Vendetta. Uh, yeah, that's yeah. a good one. I love I love that, and I love the the you always remember, don't you? Um, Hugo Weaving's voice just in that slow motion scene saying, "Ideas are bulletproof." Yes, and then everything blows yeah. up. Um, have yeah. you watched From Hell? Um, no, I have not, actually. Which, um, I don't know if you've read the Alan Moore, um... Comic. No, I always, always meant to. It's got, um, Frodo Baggins in it. It does. It, it, yeah, it also, unfortunately, has, um, Johnny Depp in it. Oh, dear. <laughs> uh, doing a very bad accent, um, and Heather Graham also doing a very bad accent. Um, but yeah, apart from that, it's, yeah, got Ian Holm, Robbie Coltrane. It's, it's, it's a bad movie. Um... It's uh, it's it's yeah, it's not a good film at all, <laughs> to be honest oh with you. Which is a shame. A shame. Again, uh, it could have been good. The only good film that Jonathan Depp ever made was Sleepy Hollow. Yeah, it was, yeah. wasn't good because of him. Sleepy Hollow is a really good movie. I do like um, I like some of his early stuff. There, there, there's a. We won't get into him as a human being. No. Um, to be honest. Um, we don't need to give any airtime to that. No. Um, but there's a very clear, from a career perspective, there's a very clear drop-off point between pre- and post-Pirates of the Caribbean. <laughs> yeah, yeah. The point at which he gets in the sea. Um, <laughs> yeah, exactly. So, like, when you're looking at his early career, you've got stuff like Nightmare on Elm Street. Um, Edward Scissorhands is a decent film. I know people, it's maybe a little bit overrated and people talk about it too much, but it is a good movie. Um, you've got things like uh, Ed Wood, the, the the movie about Ed Wood, the the, the filmmaker. Um, uh, Donny Brasco is a really good crime drama, so you'd probably hate it. Uh, <laughs> yeah, um, I've never seen it. Uh, you've got Fear and Loathing in Las Vegas, the Hunter S. Thompson adaptation. Um, Sleepy Hollow, I have seen mentioned. That. Um, but then you've got Pirates of the Caribbean in 2003, and after that, things start to drop off. So you had Once Upon a Time in Mexico the same year as Pirates of the Caribbean, which is good. 
Um, but after that, you start seeing a, a drop off, shall we say, where all of his characters seem to feel very much like uh, Captain Jack Sparrow. I don't know what voice that was. That was not Captain Jack Sparrow, but I'm going with it. That's his voice now. That sounded more like... Hi, everyone. I'm Captain Jack Sparrow. Where's all the rum gone? Where's all the rum gone? I'm from the West Country. I'm from the West Country. I'm a proper pirate. Apparently, this was on a quiz show we were watching the other day. The the sort of canonical pirate accent, or the reason everyone thinks pirates are like that, is because there was some ancient film in like the nineteen twenties where the actor who portrayed a pirate was from the West Country and used his naturalistic accent, and that is why we associate that with pirates. Ah, uh, okay. I can't. I don't know the name of the film because that, that was on a show. I'd have thought it would go back to Pirates of Penzance. Maybe that's it. Um, because that I think that that's been around for a while, hasn't it? That's that's like late nineteenth century as an opera, but then maybe they didn't use West Country accents in it. I wouldn't have thought that that singing an opera in a West Country accent is easy to do. <laughs> but um, <laughs> Arve Maria, <laughs> <laughs> you have my well, permission to take Pirates that out of my area context of and uh, and uh, and use it however you like. By the way. Also, hilariously, um, the day of the Queen's funeral is International Talk Like a Pirate Day, so that's going to be interesting on the BBC broadcast. <laughs> I have a feeling that this year they will not celebrate Talk Like a Pirate Day. Um, Boo! <laughs> um, anyway, is there anything else you want to say about <laughs> Spider-Man 2? Um, I already mentioned James Franco saying I am ruined um, in a very, very wooden way. No, I I think that's I think that's it. You know, it's it's good. Um, it's got there's a lot of like, so the very very small bit part actors are all quite famous people, aren't they? Which is quite interesting. Yeah, um, I wanted to call out. You've got another great Bruce Campbell cameo here. This time as the as the usher, the obnoxious usher, which is really good. Um, I like I liked him there. Um, I've got a note here saying "cucked by Spider Man," and I don't know what that refers to, but I assume either James Franco or no, um, sure, surely astronaut. that's J. Jonah astronaut. J. Jonah end. astronaut getting cucked by Spider Man. Yeah, um, and he gets jilted. Is being jilted the same as being cucked? I suppose it depends on the circumstance. Yeah, is is everyone who's jilted a cuck? Is everyone who's cucked jilted? So, a jilt. A jilt. <laughs> <laughs> Who knows? That's a that's a philosophical question for another time. Yeah. But yeah, you, you know, you got to feel sorry for him. But then you think, well, he's an astronaut. He's having a lot of fun. Yeah, yeah, he's he's off in space. Um, but yeah, no love, no love to be found in space. And also, imagine if J. Jonah Jameson was your dad. That would probably be exhausting. <laughs> That's actually. why he went off to space. Yeah, it's like, I don't want to be on this planet with this guy anymore. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. So, no, Spider-Man 2 is good. It's an example of a good sequel, and there are not many of those. <laughs> Yes. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. It's the train one, the one with the train. It's the one with the train. You'd love to see Spider-Man stop a moving train. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. So a couple of bits of trivia for you. Um, Toby Maguire performed the stunt when he flips over the oncoming car. Ah, Which is cool. cool. Um, apparently a stuntman also did it, but Sam Raimi thought that Maguire's looked more natural, so he used his, which is cool. Um, you've got Mr. Ditkovich who is the landlord, who's named after Steve Ditko, the original illustrator for Spider-Man. Ah, oh, yes. a nice nod. Um, it would be nice if, um, rather than just giving people nods in these movies, Marvel Comics paid the original illustrators and writers. Yeah, and, that's a whole thing, and artists, isn't it? Um, which obviously has is a big a big problem with the with the comics industry in general. It's the people who create these works and and lovingly work on these these projects for a long time don't get any of those residual payments. So look it up. This is your political message. Pay your fucking artists. Stan Lee got to be in the film, didn't he? He did. He gets a little cameo. He's he's got a little cameo. He he saves someone from some falling debris, which is nice. Um. And uh, yeah, it's, it's it's always nice when, back in this era of Marvel movies, when you see Stan Lee cameos, it feels special still, doesn't it? When you're like, oh, it's Stan Lee. Yeah, there he, there is. he is. The man himself. The man himself. Um, 
Uh, but yeah, that's it for that's it for for cameos uh, and 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 trivia. I can't be bothered to say any more. I'm tired. No, it's all good. I think we covered it. <laughs> so how are we gonna how are we gonna rate this one then? How many spiders men? Two. <laughs> <laughs> how many spiders men? Two. Hey, how many spiders men does it take to stop a moving train? So you've got a solid 17 spiders men here. It's a very heavy, powerful train. Yeah, I, I, I think I did 17 on the last one. I'm going to do 17 again. I think it's just as good. Yeah, I'd agree. Um, it feels slightly less sloppy, this movie, than the previous one, but loses a little bit of the charm. So I think it balances out, I'd say. Yeah. So, but yeah, yeah. Similar, it's focused, similar but it's also got goofs. Yes. And speaking of goof, we've got Spider Man 3 next. Notoriously. Spider Man 3 is coming. It has got a big dancing scene. That's literally the <laughs> only thing I remember about it. I remember going to see it in the cinema and being like, what the hell was that? There are two bits I remember from this movie the dancing scene, and then there's a genuinely amazing scene about Sandman, um, which I'm very excited to rewatch. So that we're gonna enter the Sandman. Yeah. Very good. Some spiders, man. I'm very excited. This has been really, really good, and I'm really, really glad we chose to do Spide Timber. Yeah, I am as well. Impromptu, but it's worked. I've enjoyed it. This is good. It's good. We like the spiders men. Look out, we like the spiders men. <laughs> <laughs> um yeah so spider-man 2 is good if you haven't seen it go watch it even if you haven't seen the first one just go watch it because you'll still get it it'll still be good it'll still yep. be fun yep still great go see it yeah all right you can find us on twitter at big boys don't pod you can email us big boys don't cry podcast at gmail.com um there's a link in our show notes so you can give us money it's just like a virtual tip jar and we'll be back next week to talk about spiders men 3 all righty bye-bye bye, -bye. bye.